Hey folks, my name's Kevin and it's time for a little bit more knife nerdery. And today we're gonna to be taking a look at the prototype of a new knife that is doing something incredibly cool that I've never seen done on a production knife before. There are no screws. There's no screws. I've only ever seen a technique like this done once or twice ever on extremely custom handmade knives, really, really expensive things. And so seeing how they pulled this off, that is incredibly cool. And that is exactly what I wanted to show you guys today. That's why I signed up for this pass around. Uh, because honestly, the blade here is very much not a me shaped blade, although I'm sure a lot of people are gonna think this is incredibly cool because it's a very stylized looking blade. The other reason why I wasn't originally going to film a whole bunch on this when I first signed up is because not a lot of details were actually known. No one knew what the knife was even called or who designed it or who made it or anything like that. Luckily, that is all officially changed. This knife is called the Neutron Star, and it is by a brand new designer whose name is Cass, K-A-S-S, -S, and he's going under the moniker Casanova Designs with a similar Cass, K-A-S-S spelling there, and I think that's really cute. There are a couple of videos you can find on YouTube of this exact prototype, and they were being listed under the name Gamer Star Studios. That's what he was originally going with, so if you wanna search for those, you can find those. I'll probably try to link a couple down below. But that name is officially gone. It's not Gamer Star Studios anymore, it's Casanova Nyes with a K. Okay, let's start talking about this knife. Up at the front here, we have a very, very stylized blade. This is the kind of thing, like I said, this is not normally a blade style I go for with a compound grind, super sharp angles and everything like that. But a lot of people are gonna think this looks incredibly cool and I can understand that. What we have here is a just under 3.2 inch blade and the sharpened blade length is the same because it starts right about here at the exact same point. And I always measure from the top of the handle there. That's out to the tip. Now this is obviously a Tanto blade profile down here and we have a compound grind where we've got a hollow grind right here and then a flat grind right here. We've got a very pronounced swedge along the top and a thumb ramp and a finger harpoon. So this is a lot going on here. And that's part of the reason why it's not super me. It's a little bit busy, but boy, does this have a very bold, pronounced, almost rhinocerosy looking quality right there, especially with this logo, though that logo will probably change. Kind of looks like an eye to me at the moment. Anyway, the blade stock here is pretty thick. What we've got is 150 thousands, a hair over. And so what that means is that this is not going to be a super duper slicer. This comes to 19 thousands behind the edge down here, but this is only just a hair over a half an inch tall grind. And so even though this is a hollow grind, it gets nice and thin at 19 thousands, it thickens back up relatively quickly and comes, like I said, to a full 150 thousands, which is gonna last all the way out to here. This entire part, the length of the blade is gonna be the full thickness. What that means is that this is not going to be a thin slicing knife. I think that's that's probably apparent, but it will enter into material as well. Being thin down here means that it's going to enter into materials, and if those materials are the kind of thing that will splay easily, something like single wall cardboard, this will still slice perfectly fine. And it'll cut perfectly fine uh, with things that are going to cut, uh, be fully separated for, in, within that first half of an inch anyway. So something like rope or string or anything like that, anything that's going to be split by just this earlier thinner part, that's gonna cut fine. Now, one thing that's really cool is the way that they're doing this swedge, because as you can see, this secondary grind here is coming up at an angle. This is a flat grind, and the angle of this, can I get that? To light focus, there we go. That's coming up like this, this kind of path, that line right there. And that means that this swedge is cutting deep, deep into that. And so this should be, and you can see it is, quite thinned out as the end. So we actually have a very nice, precise tip. Obviously don't pry with the tip of any knife, but definitely don't pry with something like this, but you'll be able to do some really good detail work. And importantly, the way that they're doing this swedge means that it still has enough thickness on top to be quite comfortable. So obviously with this little thumb ramp there, they're expecting you to put your thumb right there in this kind of grip. And the jimping here is good enough that it does kind of lock me in, but it's not the super grippiest of all time. And so what you might end up doing is instead choking up a little bit more and putting your thumb into this little harpoon shape or your finger in a harpoon shape in this kind of pinch grip. But like I was saying, you can choke up even further and lay your finger on this spine and it is still thick enough to be very comfortable if your finger is aligned with this like secondary tip right there. So if you're planning on trying to use this as a box opening secondary tip where you just pierce with that last part and pull along the top, it's really easy to have a sense of where this tip is with your finger on top and it still be very, very comfortable. And like I said, if you want to use this tip up here for some very precise cuts, you can very easily do that. But it will be high enough up that you're gonna to have to kind of rotate your entire wrist up to do that. 
So overall, I think the blade profile here isn't the kind of cutting profile that I like to go for. I like to go for tall grinds on thin stock, but a lot of people are still gonna like this and it will work well for general EDC purposes. One thing back here, you can see that the plunge is not done perfectly. Can I get that to focus? Yeah, you can see that the, the plunge grind, the thing that's taken from the full thickness down to the thinnest behind the edge, it's still ending all the way up here. And so we're starting to smile all the way up there. Can I get that to focus? Yeah, you can see the smile going up there. So on the production version, or the full version, I would like to see them pull that back slightly. I don't know if they're gonna actually have time to do that by the time this gets released, because I think it's releasing pretty darn soon. There's one other really important thing that I would like them to change, and that's these thumb studs. We'll talk all about that when we talk about the deployment in action. Oh, one more thing. The blade steel is M390, and they said it's gonna be heated between 59 and 61 HRC. Okay, let's move back to the handles. The handles here are uh, flat slabs, but with a really nice chain chamfer along the top. And so these feel really pretty good in your hand. Flat slabs like this give you a really good sense of orientation and like location in your hand because it's really clear what how this plane lines up. You can feel where your fingers are. And so you have a really good sense of whether or not the knife is like this or twisted like that or something like that. And so overall, this actually feels really nice in my hand and these chamfers are all done really, really well. We've got some interesting uh, swooping lines along this entire thing with a little bit of crest, but nothing here is sharp. None of these corners are sharp, nothing like that. And so really it's more of an aesthetic thing. And it does have enough of a curl down right here. Like I said earlier, in a pinch grip, this feels great. This fits back and nothing along this back part is sharp. And this curve right here along the front is a nice place to anchor your finger in this kind of a pinch grip that makes you feel like you have a really good secure grip. There are really nice chamfers along every single surface. Like the, there's little tiny chamfers along every single edge. There's no sharp corners or edges anywhere. Everything is very, very nicely done in that regard. As far as lock bar access goes, we've got a very small scallop right here. And you can see that based on the positioning of this, they're kind of aiming you towards this front part up here, but it's exposed this entire way down. This is an inset liner lock in the sense that a lock bar is a separate piece that is screwed in right there and there's no other liner as this part and this is a steel liner which some people are going to balk at but honestly that is exactly what I would want in a knife like this because it allows you to have a thinner lock bar because in order to have a steel lock bar insert on a titanium liner this has to be much thicker and that would spread the entire knife even thicker because they can't make this outer part any thinner than it is or else it wouldn't be stable so if you increase the thickness of this lock bar part you're going to make the entire knife wider now the width of this is just over 0.5 inches and so I wouldn't want that to be any thicker. It's a really good hand filling thickness right now. And so that's the other reason why I'm glad that this is a steel liner because it's able to stay at this relative thickness. I don't have any access problem whatsoever because the big reason why you can get in here really, really easily is that this blade stock is just 0.15 inches, like I said. So that's a thick enough gap in here that with this little scallop and that little scallop right there, you can really easily get in and unlock that knife. Now you can see that there is very significant weight relief going on inside. Let me bounce some light up in here to make that a little bit easier. Actually, I don't know how much, yeah, there you can go. You can see it's very milled out, but almost exclusively on this side. The only milling on this side is in little tiny pockets right there at the end. But that's of course because this entire side is instead cutting out to include this lock bar. Now, weight here is an interesting thing. This is a big enough, thick enough, heavy enough knife with a full long backspacer and a thick enough blade that this is not light. Even with all of that skeletonization, this knife, which I said is 3.2 inches, is 4.554 ounces, over four and a half ounces. And so it does have some weight. It's not heavy, heavy, but for its size, it definitely feels a little bit chunky. But the way that they did this colonization spreads this weight out, and so the balance point is actually pretty well done. So it's, uh, it could be, I mean, maybe hair farther forward, but this is a about where your index finger curls if you're holding it in this kind of standard grip. And so while you can feel the weight, it's distributed evenly along the handle and it's distributed relatively evenly along the blade since it comes to full thickness this all the way far out here. And so as a result, this doesn't feel unbalanced. You just feels a little bit on the heavy side. As far as other things relating to carry, this clip, well, first of all, it's really cool looking. 
if you're into Moku Tai. <laughs> so what is Moku Tai, by the way? Let's just talk about that for just a second. Um, the, you know, you've probably heard of Timascus. Timascus is a Damascus style of production using various alloys of titanium, where they've welded those together in a special way that produces these little layers. And you can get certain really wonderful colors out of that, but you can't get these colors. These colors you can really only find on Mokutai. Mokutai is the same concept, but combining the Japanese style of Mokumegane with titanium. Mokumegane is again a time, like a Damascus style of uh, billet welding where you are combining a bunch of different layers, but instead of using titanium, it uses things like copper, brass, silver, gold. And so this is going to have metals like that, probably copper, brass, maybe nickel, silver, and also titanium. And so this is Moku Tai. Now, a downside to Moku Tai is that it's not super duper flexible. And with the thickness this is, this isn't abnormally thick, but it's a little bit thick. The problem is that this thing is it is super freaking stiff. This is the biggest problem with this knife is that this this is just so freaking not bendy. So it's really, really hard to get this in and out of the pocket. I kind of hate that part. But from an overall shape and appearance perspective, I think it matches the knife really well. Uh, again, you have to be into that look, although actually you don't. So one of the options you can get is a zirconium version instead. Up here, you can see that the pivot collar is also Mokutai and the pivots themselves are black and zirconium. They're doing a version of this knife that has the clip itself in black and zirconium. But I think even that version still has the Mokutai pivot collars, but you can see that those are much more subdued. You're not getting the same kind of bright, vivid oranges in that that you're seeing on this back. And so if you do like this knife, but want a little bit more subtle version of this, you can get it with the clip in black zirconium. Now they're doing one other kind of cool thing here with the clip, and that's they're hiding the lanyard hole in the clip. There's just like this little channel going through right here. Now, to me, I don't like lanyard holds because I don't care about lanyards. And so to me, I would rather this entire clip just take up a, a shorter distance right here because man, this is not deep carry. You've got this entire big back chunk sticking out of your pocket. But also I would want this entire clip scooted further back. It's possible that they'd run into problems with how this whole screwless thing is happening. We'll talk about that when we we'll look inside. But I feel like they could move this entire thing back and it would be fine. If they were to move the entire thing back, I'd want them to ramp this back part down so this wouldn't stick out. But where it's located right now from this distance from the back, I don't feel this clip at all in my hand. It feels very, very good ergonomically. There's no hot spots, nothing's pointy. And I and I do say, and if they were to pull the entire thing back, you would feel this corner a little bit more easily. Now at this point, this is where we're gonna cut over to where I take this part and actually show you how they're pulling off this zero screw thing. It's incredibly cool. We'll cut back in a moment to talk about action. Okay, now I don't often get to take apart prototypes, but this one I know has already been taken apart before, and there is not a particularly great way to show you the kind of magic of how they're pulling this off without taking it apart. Um, up here we've got only, the only visible screws from the outside is this T8 at the pivot, and I'm pretty sure that this is the one that's gonna come out on the clip side here. Yeah, that came out easily with just me using my finger on the reverse side. Now this is, you can see, keyed on both sides and I think it's free spinning. So if it didn't come out easily for you, you would need to brace the other side with another T8. Now the only other screw on the entire knife is hidden right there. So unfortunately, because of the narrowness of this, you're not gonna be able to use a, a quarter inch bit driver like this because the bit itself won't get in. And they ship this with a tiny little T6 screwdriver, but if you have something like this, this is the iFixit style or just any other precision one that is a four millimeter, odds are it will fit. And this one fits just fine. Come right here, pop that in. And that is the only other screw. So at this point, I'm gonna turn this over because this is I took out, put that right there. This entire part should just pop off. And it does. Look at this. Okay, so I'm not gonna take the rest of this any more apart because these are loose bearing balls. It comes with other ones, but I don't want to deal with these potentially rolling all over the place. So let's just take a look at what's happening here. The clever design involves two little pieces that make up the backspacer that each attach to opposite sides. On this side, we've got one small little piece right here that has the screw hole where the screw enters into. And that attaches to this side with these 
these two screws that you never see from the outside. And because there's no good reason to take this off, you never have to worry about those. And the same thing is going on over on this side, except we have what we see from the outside as the full backspacer. You can see there's another little locating pin right here that attaches into that hole. But generally speaking, this is one big long piece attached by these two screws right there. There's little lobes right there that help you align with these little circles right there. And the, what ultimately ends up happening is that you slide this piece into that piece and then put the screw down through this hole into that hole attaching the two together. Because the screw is coming from this plane, it's preventing those pieces from sliding apart from each other. Now, the closest thing I have to anything similar to this is actually on my really high-end custom Tri-Axis Midnight. Now, they're not doing it to have hidden hardware, they're doing it to have hidden hardware for the clip. The clip on this knife attaches via a screw right there. But you can see the angle of that. That's not right down here. That's on this plane. So to get at this one, you actually have to be ridiculous and stick your screwdriver in through this hole, come all the way in and attach back there. It's an absolutely wild design. Now I said when talking about the clip that I think they could scoot this entire thing back and get away with it. I think they probably can. If we look at how this is being held in place, there's only a single screw right here and it's nowhere near interfering with these little backspacer places. Now they could easily scoot this further back and even if it got so far that it was underneath this, all you'd have to do is take the backspacer off in order to get to the screw. Maybe they were trying to avoid that, but how often do you really access the screw for the clip in the first place? But let's take this off and see if there's another problem, because if we look at how this is being done, there's two little indentations that are milled right there that these posts sit into, and that's what prevents it from being able to torque side to side. It's possible that even though this is really shallow, if we scooted this directly back, it might be overlapping with where this screw is. I'm not sure that it actually does. They're kind of below it, but it might be overlapping where this screw is, and they might be worried that that would interfere with their ability to screw securely into this side. But there's a fix for even that, because they could really easily invert this clip so that the screw is on the top side instead, and then make it so that instead of having an additional screw here, period, they just scoot this up and use the same screw right there to go all the way in into the clip. Putting this back on is as easy as holding that in place and screwing this little screw in right there. While we have this open, there is a little logo right here. I have no idea what that is. I don't know. Is that like, a, is that a knife? Is that, I think it maybe is like a knife cutting something in half, or maybe it's like a rabbit. I don't know if that is a logo that Casanova has used in the past. It doesn't, it's not what's on the blade. I have no idea what that is, but it's, it's a little logo, something. That's kind of neat. Also, we can see there is our detent ball. And like I said, it is so freaking far back, in part because this is a relatively tall lock bar. But look how small this lever arm distance is. It is tiny. That's how we're getting that close. Putting this back together is as easy as it looks. Since there's no reason to take these off, I'm not gonna, but if you did, you just have to screw these back onto those parts. You just slide this back down on top and everything just kind of clicks into place. Now at this point, I'm gonna hold this down and start putting in this pivot. I'm not gonna worry about tension right now. I'm just trying to get this to the point where it's holding the knife together. Then I'm gonna open this back up I'm going to pinch these two sides together and hold this in one hand and hold the screwdriver with the screw already attached to the tip in the other. Now it has good engagement so it'll hold on right there. So like I said, pinch the two sides together, line this up with that hole, and screw this in. Snug that down. And now let's worry about this pivot tension. Do I have any blade play right now? Nope. How's the blade? Whoa! That's delightful. Maybe I'm done. No blade play. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm done right there. I might tweak this just a little bit more in case it feels a little bit loose. Let me see. Nope, that's that is dang good. So, yep, I think we're done. It's that easy to take it apart. Okay, we're back. Let's talk about the action. Because the action of this knife is... Oh, that is buttery. This action of this knife is delightful. It has a really, really good thwack. Very, very nice. Excellent reverse flick too. Just so good. And it, the, the close on this. Huh. This is the kind of knife that closes of its own weight. If you just kind of let it swing, it just closes home with this kind of floating quality. 
It is delightful. How are they pulling that off? The way that they're making that wonderful close home is by having a heavy enough blade with a far enough out center of gravity. That's the first step. So this is, like I said, a 0.15 blade stock. And so that means this blade has a decent amount of weight and it's maintaining the full thickness this entire distance. So the center of gravity is far enough out that the lever arm is going to be relatively large. Now, again, remember the force of gravity pulling on this is going to have a certain lever arm distance, giving it a certain amount of torque trying to close home. Gravity is going to have a certain amount of torque that it can, is using to try and close the knife. Now what's resisting that is the lock bar down here. So the, the, one of the problems with, with steel liner locks is that they tend to be a little bit stiff, but this one is thin enough, and you can see they thin it out even more right there, that the lock bar pressure, the amount of force that's going for that detent ball, just isn't all that crazy high. But there's another component. Like I said, remember, this is torque fighting torque. So it's that not just the force of this, but the lever arm distance. So let's shine some light in here and you can see, do you see that detent ball back there? It is super far back, it is super far back. It's as far back as you could possibly go. And what that means is that position wise, it's all the way back here, right under the, the pivot. And so that means it has an extremely small lever arm distance. So we've got torque versus torque. We've got a, a heavy blade with a far out long lever arm distance against a relatively light enough lock bar force with a very, very short lever arm distance, which means this is able to overpower that and close. Now there is a downside to having your detent ball so far back like that. And what that is, is the further back you put your detent ball means that the more the blade is going to have to close before you encounter that detent ball. And so we have a full 21 degrees. Now 21 degrees is not crazy. Uh, in fact, that's kind of normal for the industry, or at least it was going back historically. But these days, companies like Civivi are putting out every single knife that they make at about an eight degree close. And so 21 degrees is a bit further than I'd like. Why does that matter? What that means is that you have to close this knife 21 degrees to even touch that detent ball, and even more than that in order to get up on it for you to be able to then let it have it do that kind of nice flow at home. Any further before that, and you're stuck on that detent ball. So on knives where uh, the knife easily falls to my thumb, I don't normally care about that because the way I would normally close it is have the blade fall to my thumb. And so I don't care if it has to close a good amount of distance or not. This is a knife that does not do that. If you look at the way that this goes, where this hits, that's the blade. So at best, you've got the back corner of this hitting into your thumb. Maybe it's going to hit into your finger or meat like that. And so in my experience, you can let this fall, but it's got enough heft to it that when I did that, it made little tiny nicks into my thumb in a way that made me feel uncomfortable. So the way I close this is by just closing it enough to get up on that detent ball and then letting it float home on its own. So for that reason, the fact that I have to get up on that detent ball I would prefer if getting up on that detent ball was a little bit easier and I didn't have to close it quite as far. The opening action, nice pop like that, is also because this lock bar is just enough force, but we also have pretty good deep engagement. Let's shine some light up before and you can see it's not all, it looks like it is. It's not, it's technically in person, not 100% deep detent ball engagement, but it's pretty darn close to it. And so what we have is a good poppy kind of detent. Now I said earlier on that one of the few things I would want them to change about this knife is these thumb studs, because honestly, I don't get it. Now we do have a really round, bulbousy pivot right here, so maybe that's the tie-in, but aesthetically, it just does not make sense to me to put these big, round, very soft, smooth thumb studs on a knife that is just totally aesthetically dominated by angles. But the bigger thing is that you have to get up under the, the side of these for it to work. There's just no grip along this top at all. And it means you can't come from the side. There's no significant uh, cutaway here that would give you access to the side. And so you have to come from below. And if you just kind of go along the top, it's really easy to slide off this. You have to come catch it from the below and push up. Now, if you do that, it works very reliably. But some people aren't used to pushing up. They want to push out. And it's, you can see, it's really hard to do that. Same thing with reverse flick, you have to come from below and push up. It's not hard to do, it's just not what everyone's used to, and it would be better if you could come from the side, but you just don't have the grip. But I don't think that they're actually gonna change that in time for the production, I don't know, maybe they will. I hope they do. It's not a deal breaker for me, and if you really, really hated it, I'm sure you could remove them and put in something else on there. Okay, let's talk about my final thoughts, pricing, availability, all that kind of stuff. 
This version here with the, the Mokutai, Mokutai is a very expensive material. This version with the Mokutai clip, this one is $355. The version with the black zirconium clip, that is $310. And remember that either way, you're getting a zirconium pivot here and a Mokutai pivot collar. That's not cheap. That is a pretty hefty price tag. And so you might start asking, well, who made this? Because that is easily in the Riot pricing range as far as OEM knives go. And the answer is no, Leibing made this. Leibing. Have you ever heard of Leibing? No. The reason why you haven't heard of Leibing probably is because there's an entire whole world of Chinese knife production that just never really makes it to the US. They, they're not used by uh, brands that we hear of in the US and they don't directly market in the US. You can really only find Leibing made knives on things like AliExpress. But that doesn't mean that they're poorly made. This is a very, very well-made knife. Everything about this, the production of this, feels exceptionally well done. All of the materials look so good. The, the, the finishing on everything is so good. The way that this is able to fall is not partly because of just how uh, sturdy and, and well done this overall, like the, the, the parallelism of the handles. Like things like this are difficult to do. This whole back thing here is difficult, complex milling. This is well made. So even though I've never heard of Libing outside of a couple of Love Them Knives videos that he ordered off of AliExpress, I don't think you should be too scared off from that price tag. I think it's on the high end, but I think it's I think if you're digging the way this this knife looks, the functionality is certainly there and the production quality certainly feels like it's there to me too. And like I said, I've never seen anything doing this cool clipless thing before on a production knife. So as far as availability, the this knife, this brand going forward is going to be available exclusively through Good Screw. If you've never heard of Good Screw, they are a pretty new brand that primarily sells uh, high-end titanium and other material screwdrivers, which is where that name screw comes from. Uh, they've got a very kind of punny branding, and so hence good screw, good screw, go screw yourself, that whole thing. Um, in addition to screwdrivers, they've already for a long time, they've had uh, other kinds of items on their site. They've had uh, replacement scales for Chris Reeves knives. They've had little keychain tools. They've got bit holders. They've got other stuff. And one of the things they're branching into is now carrying knives. And they're going to carry the products from Casanova Designs going forward, from knives like this to other knives that he produces, but also things like EDC pouches or other EDC gear that Casanova decides to create. So my final thoughts on this is that I think it's really, really cool. I think as a as a first design from someone, I think this is a very impressive initial effort. It's stylistically not a knife for me, so I'm not going to be picking one up, but I think a lot of people are going to find this incredibly cool. I think mechanically the way it's doing this is incredibly cool, and the overall action and quality level on this just feels... It's a joy to play with. <laughs> it's great. So I hope you found this interesting. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll catch you guys next time.